everyone and welcome to this the final reach insight but we've got a very special interview today with an exceptionally talented musician and an amazing individual who we'll find out more during this interview so it's a great pleasure to welcome Cornell Hariska Munn. Hi Cornell thanks for joining us. Hi thank you very much for having me it's a real pleasure to be here today. We've got so much to talk about and uh, we were just chatting before the interview and I said, you my goodness, we've got lots uh, to get through and um, you've got a, a fascinating life. And I'd like to start off, really, if I may, at the very beginning, because you were you don't sound it, but you were actually born in Romania. Yes, I was. I was born in Romania in the very early 90s in the wake of the Ceausescu dictatorship era. So that's yeah, that's where I was born in 91 in northern Romania. It was very cold. Bit of a bleak existence to be honest but yeah that's where i was born <laughs> but uh, you very soon made uh, worcester your home yeah so i was i mean very long story short i was taken from my parents by a doctor because i was born disabled no lower arms and a twisted right leg and put in an orphanage and i made worcester my home when two aid workers dorian and ken munn who are now my adoptive parents we'll skip a bit that's spoilers uh came over and brought me over to um, the uk for treatment i had my right leg amputated and i remained with them until until i you know until i moved out they became my mom and dad they adopted me and then yeah i ended up in worcester i mean it's an extraordinary thing for them to do to take on a child, first of all, from Romania, from a different country, um, as you say, in that environment as it was in the early 90s, but also a, a child with limb differences as well. Um, you know, what an extraordinary you know, opportunity for you, but what an extraordinary change of life for them. Yeah, my uh, adopted parents had already had four children of their own. They're all grown up children. And this was, I guess, a new challenge for them. But uh, I think they enjoyed it, to be honest. I think, you know, it seemed to go well. We have a very rewarding and loving relationship. And tell us a little bit about those sort of early days in, in, in Worcester and how, as a family, um, they dealt with your differences. Because unlike most families, um, most reach families who maybe discover that their child has a difference, you know, the main moment they're born or maybe actually these days more and more at an early scan. For you, obviously, it was a very different set of circumstances. So your adopted parents, you know, knew what they were taking on. Des describe what it, would have been, what it would have been like for them in those early days and how they dealt with the situation, given the fact that you were a child with, with your differences? I think they had an idea that they were always going to be supportive when they took it on. They were always happy to do so. Uh, I remember my dad talking to me about it, saying, you know, in the very early days, there was some maybe, you know, not knowing exactly how to handle it, how to pick, you know, how to pick up a child with limb differences or things like that. But uh, those were those fears were alleviated, I think, quite quickly with the support which I received from both them and my school. And when I received prostheses and treatment for my limb differences and i think actually we settled into family life really quickly it wasn't too much of an issue fortunately and of course you know you you weren't a reach child you you actually only came to find out about reach much later so the resources that reach have and can offer reach families today obviously makes a huge difference so where did your parents find out about the help that was available for them about prostheses about you know how to look after a child with limb difference in truth, the resources they had were quite limited. So regarding prosthesis, they knew that they existed and just were quite proactive and approached the national health and GPs, which would, you know, obviously forward onto specialists, uh, things like that. Um, regarding how to, you know, look after and raise a child with limb, limb differences, I think they kind of just got on with it and raised, raised me as they would have done a child without, but just understood that there might be additional physical challenges to do along the way but I think they just took it on with that sort of approach really like they would have their other children save the fact they sought support like I said through GPs and through other services which they found often through word of mouth. Now you you very early on you you know like every reach family you had this whole debate i suppose as a, as a family about whether to use prostheses or or not to use them and so on how did you feel when when you were young that whole de you know that, that whole decision about actually sometimes it's easier not to have them actually that's useful that's not and so on how did that sort of conversation go 
I was given quite a lot of autonomy from a really young age regarding prosthesis. I mean, the treatment I had when I came over to the UK was a leg amputation and uh, subsequently I wore a prosthetic leg and still do. And that was necessary for me to walk and I never questioned that. That was always something which when I was very young I was given this leg and it was always something I would, you know, I would need to get around more so. Uh, when it came to uh, upper limbs and prostheses like that, I was given the opportunity by my parents and the various professionals to try different things out. And actually I was able to put these prostheses on and take them off myself. And fortunately, that was quite an autonomous thing. I was never forced to wear them, never forced to do anything like that because I found a way to handle day-to-day -day tasks without wearing them often. So actually, since I was around three years old, I've never worn upper body prostheses. And what was school like? Give us an idea of, of, of what that was like for you and, and how you overcome overcame various challenges. And as you said, without prostheses as well. School was generally quite a positive experience. I was supported by the school with what I needed, but generally I was quite capable. So I was quite academically capable from a young age, fortunately. But I did begin at um, nursery school in the first couple of years wearing a prosthesis on my arm and my upper body. And one time their teachers recall the story when uh, a lot of the other children didn't realize it was an upper arm prosthesis. They hadn't paid much attention. And I got sick of it halfway through an afternoon. I took it off, uh, which led to a classroom of chil screaming children who didn't realize this. And that was that really. But I remember from taking it off at that moment, I never really wore it again. I just worked out how to do different things through various either assistive technology things, straps from my arms or things like that, or just practice. And I was fortunate with teaching assistants that were put in place for me and my parents would encourage me to find new ways of doing things. That was the really key thing there. It was never, a, I can't do this. It was very often a, how are you going to do this? And would push me and challenge me even from a young age to overcome what would be day-to-day -day tasks for people without limb differences. We know you now for your music. That's you know clearly something that has been a complete passion for you. At what point did you discover that you loved music and that actually you could play? I discovered I loved music quite late on actually. So I didn't really I didn't really have much interest in it or playing it particularly until I started secondary school. So when I was around 11, 12 years old and I started with the drums quite simply because my parents offered to give me, you know, offered me music lessons at a new school uh, when I started. And we all thought maybe the only instrument I could play would be drums. You know, it was a, the obvious place to start for some reason, because obviously I can hold things in my left arm, but my right arm, I would require a strap on, a strap on to it. And it were, I already had those straps and I just started having drum lessons. And I realized I was quite good at it when the teacher's book that was supposed to take the five years of secondary school, I got through it in about six months. So I realized I had a bit of an aptitude for it and I started to love it from then and sort of had my own drum kit very early. Again, my parents were very supportive of it and were happy to nurture that. So that's how the drumming started. And then following that, the bass guitar, honestly, I was just listening to the music, which I enjoyed. I think it was the Red Hot Chili Peppers at the time. And I just liked the way the instrument sounded. So I remember I had a drum kit at the time and I sold part a couple of cymbals off it and bought myself a bass guitar and just taught myself really, just thought there's got to be a way I can do this and just spent time on the internet learning how to play. So yeah, I was self-taught on the bass. We speak to a lot of reach children who say that sometimes the you know the the, the, the challenges are put in their way by other people who make assumptions about people's ability because of their limb difference. Did you experience that? And it, it doesn't sound like you did particularly. It sounds like you had a, a very supportive school. In, in which case, what would you say to any child um, that maybe is getting that kind of reaction from their school or parents or anybody else about their ability to play music? I was fortunate in school that I haven't come up against that attitude, but actually later in life in after my professional life and sometimes my music life, it's actually impacted me more now than it did as a child, those sorts of attitude. And those assumptions can be damaging. And what I would say to the children, you know, reach children who want to do these things, don't give up and push yourself because you probably can do it. I bet there would be a way that you can ingeniously do this. And I know we can't control what schools and other places do, but what I'd say to reach parents is if your child, your reach child has an interest in doing something you might not think they can do, Give it a try. Let them do it. There's no harm in trying it. And more often than not, you'll find they will be capable, especially if you can assist them in 
maybe trying to find solutions to do these things. Now, of course, that that you automatically now have become a role model potentially for somebody who is interested in pursuing uh, music as whether it's for fun or a career or whatever. And I know that's not particularly your objective to become a role model, but it's one of the great things about Reach that if people have an interest in a certain aspect of life, the chances are there's a Reach child who's gone there uh, before them. But you didn't have that kind of role model, did you? I never really had a role model growing up at disabled role model or a role model with any limb differences. No, I never really had that role model growing up. I kind of carved my own way out in the world. And actually, a lot of my role models and people that I like to listen to, musicians, drummers, bass players, um, these weren't people with limb differences. But I think that spurred me on in a way to actually think that actually I can do this with a limb difference, even if they haven't got one. I wanted to be the same, you know, I wanted to have that level of equality and reach that level of standard of professional musicians who didn't have limb differences. But later on, I've realized is that actually, uh, sh I don't see that there should be a difference between somebody with a limb difference playing music and somebody without a limb difference playing music. That standard could be the same, you know, people with limb differences can be as good or better than people without limb differences who play music. And I think actually having that resource within reach you know with reach from reach is an excellent resource for people to look up to for role, mo role models for people who want to do these things that actually people can achieve great things with a limb difference that equal or surpass those without limb differences and i think that's a fantastic base that reach provides for role models for for that sort of thing and and, and how about your career what did you decide did you go through various ideas at school of what you wanted to do and how did you come to choose the path you did in the end? I've had all sorts of ideas of what I wanted to do for a career. So I wanted to be a lawyer for a little while. I did some training as a solicitor for a little while, actually, but I also wanted to be a pilot. I love aviation. Uh, I've wanted to be, you know, a musician, professional musician. To be honest, I still kind of do, but that's something which is slightly on the back burner <laughs> due to the nature of being a musician. You know, not everyone can make it, can they? But actually, so what I do now is I'm... I've just started actually quite recently. I'm the accessibility manager for a large transport company, a large train com company across the UK. So I manage all their provision. I'm the senior person to do with disability accessibility across their business. And yeah, I oversee people who deliver those things and try and write strategy and try and push accessibility forward. And it's a career that I love, but it's not a career path I'd say I've chosen and a interesting oh again very long story short uh i was fortunate enough to attend oxford university got a bachelor's degree got a master's degree uh, i do like my academics uh got a master's degree in philosophy and theology and from there i've i saw all my peers gain excellent jobs you know fantastic inner city jobs and things like that and i noticed i was being left behind and i was a bit disappointed and i was like why can't i get these good jobs what's happening and you know it took a while to dawn on me. And I always declared my disability on my CV or in applications or people found out pretty quickly. And again, long story short, it dawned on me that there's a disparity in recruitment, especially in leadership positions and good jobs between disabled people and non-disabled people. And it's just something I wasn't happy with. So I started my, you know, I wanted to change something about that. So I got involved with inclusive recruitment, trying to persuade employers to, yeah, employ disabled people, but more than employ, I went, employers to employ retain and progress staff you never hear about disabled managers very often you know fortunately i'm a manager of a you know a national provision for a large company now but i'm in the tiny minority as a disabled person in that role and i really wanted to change something about that and hope that we could change the landscape for disabled people to not have the challenges that i had which were completely attitudinal um i don't have any expensive reasonable adjustments and even so reasonable adjustments are you know part and parcel to uh a workplace a good workplace and i think that disabled people have so much to offer to a workplace and i want to show that in, in senior position it's really interesting because we hear about unconscious bias in many fields we hear it particularly about um race uh, about maybe gender but actually we don't hear it maybe quite as much uh, when it comes to disability. And it, it's great that you're out to change that. It's great that your company have taken you on. You know, from your perspective, you must be discovering all sorts of amazing things that you can get involved in and change. I found that recently when I've 
been working in accessibility for the last few years that there's a lot of things that you can change, you can influence people. There are some organisations which are so forward thinking and are really working to help disabled people in the workplace and disabled customers on various services. So obviously rail services, which I'm managing now. But there's also so many people who are quite excited to learn new things about that. And what you said about unconscious bias is key. I think that, you know, it's I think that unconscious bias for disabled people in the workplace exists maybe stronger because, you know, it's scandalous to say uh, it's, you know, it's not acceptable to say that somebody of a certain race or gender or sexuality would be worse at a job than anybody else. But as soon as you mention disabled person, are they, you know, could they be worse at a job than anybody else? People seem to be like, oh, but what if they can't do this? What if they can't do that? And that's something that you don't get with other demographics and protected characteristics. And actually, that needs to be challenged. Uh, quite readily and quite directly um, through disabled role models, through an equality of recruitment practices and through a better understanding that disabled people can achieve things on an equal footing, like I said, or surpass those um, who are not disabled. And in, in your current role, you're in the, in the transport world. And of course, you know, transport has long been the focus of accessibility for uh, disabled people. And especially, you know, people, you know, we have many people within the REACH community who drive and are, are incredibly self-sufficient when it comes to transport. But of course, some people do still have those, those challenges. Um, what, what are you discovering, you know, with the company that you're working for? What, what sort of big surprises have come out of it that you thought, Wow, I'd have never thought that. At the moment, this might sound like a cynical answer, but I'm not really surprised at anything that I've seen, to be honest. <laughs> I've seen a lot of people, um, uh, yeah, I've seen a lot of people very passionate about accessibility and who want to change things. I've seen a lot of people who will say they want to change things, but then actually when it comes down to it, there's not much work to be put in. And there's a lot of people that just want to do things the same way that they've done them for the past 30 years. So I've seen it's a very mixed bag. And actually, I'm not overly surprised to what I've found so far. Yeah, I, I think anybody you know, in, in your position, any, any, any of our rich families would, would probably echo that. Absolutely. You've got yourself involved in so many different things. You've got your music. You've got a, a, a very successful career um, and you're still studying. I'm not studying at the moment. I would like to study. I've written a couple of papers to do with disability and music. One was published by the Cambridge University Press relatively recently. Uh, but I've got ambitions to study a PhD relating to disability, maybe relating to theology or philosophy. But I've got ambitions to do that in hopefully the near future. And you're clearly passionate about the cause, about equality, about making sure that, you know, people are looked after and people do have equal accessibility, both physically and, you know, within their careers and everything else. And you, you've done quite a lot of work with charities. Tell us a bit more about that, because you've, I know you've raised quite a lot of money along over the years. So over the years, I've done a fair bit with various charitable foundations. So I've raised money for, um, I raised money for some friends of mine back in Romania who required cancer treatment. I've raised money for people with limb differences, upper, upper limb differences to uh, obtain treatment either in this country or abroad to gain prostheses and various support along those things. And I've raised money for people, disabled people back in my home country of Romania um, under the banner of my own foundation, the Cornell Romanian Rehabilitation Centre Trust. That was something I did for a few years and that was funding clinical visits and uh, various treatments of prosthetics and orthotics over in Romania for people, like I said, in my home country, because that's a provision that doesn't exist there. There's still backwards attitudes about disability. Um, but that's something which I was passionate about for a number of years. And I've done various other odd fun, you know, the odd fundraising thing to do with music or to do with public speaking or to do with anything else. So, yeah, that's something I've done quite a lot of over the years. Now, you, you, you come across as an extremely driven individual, somebody who's, you know, determined and someone who's going to make it work, whatever happens. Some parents might be thinking that, you know, that's great. You, you've been able to do that. But we don't necessarily see that in our child. They don't have the same level of confidence. They don't seem to be quite as 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 confident at pushing themselves forward is there anything you would say to parents to maybe help them encourage their youngsters to become a little bit more you know independent thinking to become you know more confident in their in, in their lives so first of all as maybe this is an encouragement maybe not but first of all 
uh, an encouragement. Like I come across very confident, and I am very confident and very driven. But naturally, and actually growing up, I'm actually I've been known to be quite lazy in various things. And <laughs> disabled people can be lazy. We're not all these driven, independent individuals. And I've been known to be quite lazy. And actually, I thank my parents for motivating me in a lot of things along the way. You know, I guess with the things that I did, I kept pushing expectations in certain ways. And there were times I didn't want to do my homework or didn't want to do this practical thing, this physical thing, or didn't want to go to this place. And actually, my parents would just would give me that nudge and say, come on, you've done this loads, just keep going, you know, keep doing it and keep doing that sort of thing. And actually, naturally, because I was quite lazy, I think that push that I had from my parents helped develop this confidence, which I had, because what happens is when you develop sort of confidence and push someone to do something, not not overly pushy, but encourage someone to do something maybe that they're not comfortable with or maybe that they are, you know, feeling, you know, sometimes just can't be bothered to do, quite frankly. When that thing is a success, that again pushes expectations up and up and up. And I'm a big fan of sort of expanding on and exceeding expectations. And when you do something, when you try something you don't particularly want to do, when you succeed at it, or you encourage someone to try and do something they don't know they can do and they succeed at it, that pushes those expectations further and provides a platform to, again, exceed those expectations and achieve those things. And that builds confidence within the person. You've talked about, you know, you, you know, writing a paper and about continuing to pursue your career. Um, you sound like somebody who would be great in something like politics or activism. I would, I have an interest in politics. I do. Um, I, keep it quite quiet but I do have I do have an interest in politics I'm quite I'm quite politically minded um I still maintain with my friends that I've called the outcome of the last few referendums and elections for the past like 10 years or so I've been able to call it because of public opinion but that's just me I just I like I, I do I do have an interest in it um activism is an interesting one because I think that activism is something which I haven't really got involved with because it's a bit of a catch-22 for me. Uh, activism has an important role, but also I think disabled people don't have to be activists. They have a right to just live a normal life and a normal life with sort of equal opportunities. And that's what I've taken on. I've taken that approach on. I want to pursue my career. I want to help people with accessibility. Of course I do. But also I want to increase my career and my opportunities for me, for myself, um, for a lot, a lot of the times. And so that my family can have a good life as well. So I think that activism has been a bit less of an interest to me personally, but I absolutely see the value of it for, you know, people who are that way inclined, definitely. Now, you you were talking earlier on about your music and I've seen your videos and we'll make sure that people can see you on YouTube. You're a little bit like me. You have a name that's easy to find if you look on, look for you on social media and things. So, you know, you're not you're not difficult to find. So people can see you and see you play your music and everything, which is brilliant. How do you, you touched on the fact that you might want to pursue a professional career if only the opportunity arose. As soon as lockdown allows and uh, live gigs happen again, what would you like to see? Where would you like to go with it? I don't think lockdown has been that much of a hindrance to my music directly, fortunately, because actually, the, you know, the Internet is here. And actually, if you have the opportunity to put yourself out there on the Internet and do creative things and interesting things musically and get your name out there and work on that marketing side, that's the way it's been going in the industry for the past five years, I would say, probably for opportunities. So I'm actually obviously I love playing live. It's my favorite thing. And I'm going to try and seek out those opportunities as much as possible. But online, I'm going to keep doing what I'm doing, really keep pushing that, keep trying to drive up the numbers, keep trying to make sure people see what I do and what I'm about and keep applying for things. So entering music competitions. So I was fortunate enough to, I won the UK drum off uh, final. I was the winner for the open category for the UK drum off final um, last year. And then that meant that I was able to go on to be a final finalist in the global drum off. So that was a big platform that I was able to perform on all digitally or virtually. And that's something I want to keep going. I will always take an opportunity and I've learned that. There are opportunities I didn't take with, earlier in my career musically, which I regret not taking. And now, even though you know it means moving around my day job and things like that, I'm not going to make those same mistakes twice. I'm willing to put the effort in and really make the effort to take these opportunities. Uh, well, as I said, people can follow you on uh, all the social media, and we'll we'll make sure we give you an opportunity to uh, mention all of that a little bit later on. What else? You, you seem to be someone who. You know, if you if you want to, if you if you fancy something, you'll give it a go. Is there anything else that we haven't talked about that's lurking in the background that you'd like to have a go at? 
Oh, that's a good question. I mean, I'd love to learn more instruments. I'm always, you know, on the lookout for sort of musical instruments, I mean, musical instruments and endeavours for that sort of thing. But I mean, I'm, I work in accessibility now. I'd love to give owning my own business a go. Like I've worked in various areas of um, accessibility and I'm quite, you know, I've got quite a good commercial head on my shoulders. I've worked for public and private sector organisations as well as charities and I think I could run a business. I know it's easier said than done. Of course it is. And, you know, all the day to day sort of invoicing and everything that, that bores me to tears quite frankly i'm not interested in that at all but and i know that's so important but the actual day-to-day -day running a business i think would be interesting to do uh, of course there's academically i'm really interested in pursuing my phd maybe doing some lectures and some papers in future some research papers uh, i love travel i love driving so i'm one of those people with a limb difference who can drive um I'm about to swap over my cars at the moment. I'm a motability customer and I'm about to swap one car for another. But I like, you know, I like nice cars. I like fast cars and I like driving, you know, various different places in the UK and in Europe. So I'm excited to get out and explore more when my new car arrives. Now, you've only found out about Reach relatively recently. How did you find out about it and uh, what actually happened there? In truth, Reach approached me. Reach um, saw some of the music things which I've been posting on my Instagram page and Reach reached out, reached out to me. And from that, I obviously researched into it and looked into the great work that Reach were doing. And it's kind of gone from there, really, this excellent resource that I never had growing up, that my family never had growing up, that could, I think, benefit so many people. Well, hopefully we'll get to see you at a, at a Reach weekend sometime. Maybe uh, you, you're a great speaker. I can see you captivating an audience, though. If you, if you would, uh, it's nothing like putting you on the spot here, but uh, if you wouldn't mind coming down and uh, speaking to uh, families and things, I, I know you would be, and um, people would absolutely love to listen to you. I love public speaking, and that would be an absolute pleasure to speak at a Reach weekend and something like this for, for yourselves. It would be wonderful. Brilliant. Consider yourself booked. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, you know, it, it, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you today. You know, you you are an inspiration. I know it's not your main focus. It's not really what, you know, you don't see yourself as that. But just by virtue of what you've achieved, what you've done and how you've done it is, is just fantastic. And I know people want to stay in touch with you. So how can they find out more about you, about maybe some of your fundraising that you're doing? And most importantly, build up your fan base for your music. Social media has been king for me recently in my, in my connections. So uh, my biggest sort of musical posting that I do at the moment, as well as a little bit of an insight into my everyday life is probably my Instagram page. So I'm on Instagram at Cornell Munn. So that's C-O-R-N-E-L-M-U-N-N. -N. Uh, although if you misspell it, you still find me. So that's one of the things. That's one <laughs> of the things. Uh, on Facebook, similar again, if you look for me, uh, Cornell Prisker Munn or Cornell Prisker Munn Music. Again, if you spell that wrong, you know, Cornell Music, you'll find me eventually. Uh, and on Twitter, Cornell H. Munn. Um, that's when I go on my slightly longer accessibility and disability rants sometimes. That's my soapbox, Twitter <laughs> is. But I put music on there as well. And uh, YouTube. So, you know, please do watch, follow, like, subscribe to my YouTube. And that's my username on that is Cornell Munn again. So C O R N E L M U N N. Those are the best places to find me. Uh, I will be building a website. I haven't built it yet. Um, I taught myself coding a couple of years ago, so I'm trying to work through the masses of code to build myself a website. And I'm about halfway through and it looks terrible at the moment. But when that's <laughs> up and running, I'll be promoting that too. You should do what I do, just buy it off the shelf. Or, as you said before, there's certain aspects of running a business you're not particularly keen on. Well, that's where you get other people in and you can do the things that you do want to do. And that, that I would definitely recommend that. But, uh, Cornell, it's been such a pleasure talking to you today. Thank you so much. And what a great way to finish our series of insights here at Reach. So uh, thank you very much indeed for being our final guest. We really appreciate it. Thank you. It's a pleasure. And to everybody watching at home, don't forget that uh, these resources are going to be available. If you haven't seen the whole series of interviews we've done, then do have a look on the REACH website. You'll find the links to all of these videos there. And uh, we've had such an amazing time over the last few weeks speaking to incredible individuals from such a diverse background. And it's a real pleasure to have spoken to them all. And 
please do look at those videos and uh, really enjoy the inspiration that they give. Now, as we said, this is the end of this series of interviews and insights at REACH, but we will be back well, in a different form, we'll hopefully see you at the Reach Weekends coming up, whether it's live or whether it's hybrid or whether we will be online again. Who knows? But we will definitely be back again. I'd like to thank all of our guests uh, throughout this series and especially now just to uh, Cornell for finishing up the series. Uh, James, who's been working very hard behind the scenes, making all the tech happen. But most of all, for you for joining us. Don't forget the Reach pages on their website. All those resources are there for you. We hope to see you again very, very soon. But in the meantime, take care. Bye for now.